Welcome back to another Space News Weekly Rundown. We have lots to cover today, from Flight 8 static fire action at SpaceX's Starbase, launches from Falcon 9, Electron, New Shepard and the final ever Soyuz 2.1V, as well as a spacewalk on the ISS from Butch and Sunny, as their return to Earth gets delayed again due to issues with SpaceX's newest Crew Dragon vehicle, as NASA reshuffles spacecraft to account for this. And Boeing has warned its employees that it might well all be over for SLS, with contracts possibly being cancelled next month. All of this and a whole lot more, so settle back and let's begin. Starship Flight 8 is the current big event we're all waiting for with SpaceX's Starship program, and things really picked up the pace last week with regard to this, as both expected vehicles, Ship 34 and Booster 15, began their static fire test campaigns, which are always the most exciting tests to see, after the launches themselves of course. The first of the pair to see action was Booster 15, which was rolled out to the launch pad on Saturday. Having already completed its cryoproofing tests, we knew that this was going to be a static fire test. After a lengthy drive from the production area to orbital launch pad A, it was lifted and mounted ready for testing. Yesterday, the action began, with propellant loading made evident by the formation of ice along the fuselage of the vehicle. Then we saw activation of that water deluge system, followed by full duration static fire test of Super Heavy. NASA Spaceflight captured some excellent footage of this. Unfortunately, SpaceX are yet to release anything other than some photos, but they do usually supply us with some nice drone view footage a few days after the test is done, so I'll revisit this in next week's episode if that happens. Make sure to hit subscribe so that you don't miss it. Before the booster static fire, and as you can see before the booster itself was installed on the launch pad, SpaceX conducted purge venting of both the Raptor engine QDs and the booster hood QD. This basically expels any dust, dirt, and you know, other contaminants from the system, since these haven't been used since Flight Test 7, and it's a pretty standard thing to do prior to hooking up a live booster. As of this morning, the booster was lifted off the pad, held at the very top of the tower for about 20 minutes, and then it was lowered down onto the booster transport stand. Booster 15 is, of course, only one half of the Flight 8 full stack. Ship 34 will be the vehicle it carries. This has also begun the process of static fire testing, though the test itself hasn't happened just yet. What has happened is a relocation. Earlier today, it was lifted onto the mobile static fire stand behind the door of Mega Bay 2, and then it began its journey to the Massey's test site in the dark early hours. It has since arrived at the site, so we can expect static fire tests to begin sometime within the next few days. In addition to Ship 34, a mysterious test tank, so far referred to as Test Tank 16, though the actual serial number remains unconfirmed, was also rolled out from the production area to the Massey's test site. It's going to be undergoing structural testing, something that was made apparent when SpaceX fitted two structural testing beams to its top. Things continued on with the addition of what looks like simulated chopstick arms either side, so it's very likely that Test Tank 16 is designed to verify the structural integrity of the ship's fuselage during the first catch attempt. The first catch will likely not happen until at least Flight Test 9 due to the loss of the vehicle during Flight Test 7. Flight Test 8 will almost certainly just be a repeat of Flight 7, but you know, with less explosions on board the ship. If the first catch attempt is going to be on Flight Test 9, then it'll almost certainly be Ship 35 to do it. And last week it was seen fully stacked for the first time, sporting an almost complete heat shield as well. What we'll almost certainly never see fly now is Ship 32. While it looks pretty much good to go, this is the old Block 1 design, which SpaceX has retired in favour of Starship Block 2, which is what Ship 34 and Ship 35 are. There's not really much need to keep Ship 32 around, and last Friday it was moved from the Rocket Garden into the High Bay, where it will likely undergo scrapping. In the world of Falcon 9, there were two Starlink launches on Tuesday and Saturday, both of which were launched from Kennedy Pad 40, and we also had a very foggy launch on Tuesday from Kennedy Pad 39A, a Falcon 9 carrying two Worldview Legion electro-optical Earth observation satellites for Maxar Technologies. Together, the two satellites will join Maxar's existing network of commercial satellites which will provide customers with high resolution and frequency monitoring and mapping of the Earth's surface. The satellites were successful deployed and are now reportedly operational. So far, Maxar has one more launch planned with SpaceX, launching sometime next year. 
Blue Origin conducted a suborbital launch of their new Shepard rocket on Tuesday. This was an uncrewed research mission and was particularly interesting as its primary objective was to mimic lunar gravity for NASA by spinning the cargo capsule at 11 revolutions per minute, achieved by using the craft's reaction control system to generate artificial gravity. There were a total of 30 scientific payloads on board coming from various organizations including Purdue University, Honeybee Robotics, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the Glenn Research Center. The experiments focused on understanding fluid dynamics, combustion processes, and bubble formation under simulated lunar gravity conditions. Both the booster and the capsule made successful touchdowns after the flight. Saturday saw a launch from New Zealand's Mahia Peninsula. This was of course a Rocket Lab Electron, and on board were the next batch of five Kinase nanosatellites. This mission was dubbed IOT for you and me, named such because the Kinase satellite constellation is an IOT, or Internet of Things constellation. The launch was a success and marked the fourth of five dedicated launches with five Kinase Internet of Things satellites from Rocket Lab. The final Kinase launch is expected sometime in March. We said goodbye to the Soyuz 2.1V rocket last week as it made its final ever launch from Russia's Plesetska launch site, carrying three military satellites to polar low Earth orbit. The Soyuz 2.1V's main distinguishing feature is that it's a single core rocket rather than a core with the iconic four surrounding boosters. Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams launched aboard Boeing Starliner back on the 5th of June 2024 for an eight-day flight test. However, it is now 250 days later, and they are very much still aboard the International Space Station. This extended mission duration was, of course, due to the Starliner developing thruster issues, leading NASA to deem it too dangerous to return crew back to Earth, reassigning Butch and Sonny to the roster of SpaceX Crew-9, which launched in September, carrying just two astronauts on board so that there'd be two empty seats for Butch and Sonny to return on. The reason I'm recapping this now is because there's been some updates regarding their return to Earth. The original plan was to have them come home in February, so, you know, this month, but NASA is now expected to announce a return date no earlier than the 19th of March. The reason for this delay is because the next SpaceX Crew Dragon mission, Crew 10, will feature the brand new C-213 Dragon capsule, which is currently facing some technical issues, possibly related to its batteries, leading NASA to conclude it won't be flight ready until late April at the earliest. According to sources of Ars Technica reporter Eric Berger, NASA has requested SpaceX to instead use Crew Dragon Endurance for Crew 10, which last returned to Earth in March 2024 after supporting the Crew 7 mission. It was scheduled to carry the private Axiom 4 mission to the space station, but sources are now pointing to it being swapped over to Crew 10, with the delayed C-213 Dragon being shuffled over to support Axiom 4. The reason that NASA simply can't wait for the C-213 capsule to be ready for Crew 10 is because the station program would start to approach red lines on food water and other essential crew supplies. So that's the latest with that. Speaking of Axiom 4, the crew roster was announced last week. It will be commanded by former NASA astronaut and current director of human spaceflight at Axiom Space, Peggy Whitson, who will be joined by the first astronaut from the Indian Space Research Organization to the space station, as well as the first astronauts for Poland and Hungary. Back to Butch and Sonny, while they're going to be up there a little bit longer than expected, they're not just stuck at the station with nothing to do. Last week, they both embarked on a 5-hour, 26-minute spacewalk, marking Sonny's ninth time in the vacuum of space and Butch's fifth. They completed a number of tasks, including the removal of a radio frequency group antenna, or just RFG antenna, from the station truss, and they also collected samples of surface material for analysis from the Destiny Lab and Quest airlock. This wasn't the first time this RFG antenna has been slated for removal. Previous spacewalks were unable to release it from its mounting plate. So this time Butch and Sunny used a specially designed wrench to release the hardware and it's now being stowed in the airlock and will return back to Earth for refurbishment. It's an important bit of kit that supports the station's radio communications that allow the station to transmit and receive signals. NASA continues to share footage inside the vehicle assembly building of stacking operations for the SLS rocket that'll support the Artemis 2 mission, but right now the SLS's days are looking numbered. 
Boeing, the main contractor that develops the massive rocket's core stage, held an all-hands meeting on Friday with around 800 employees in attendance. It lasted only six minutes and consisted of Boeing Vice President David Butcher informing everyone that the contracts for the SLS could end in March and that they should prepare for layoffs in a scripted delivery described by one attendee as cold and scripted. I'm not really that surprised. SLS is an obscenely expensive launch vehicle and while the sunk cost fallacy is definitely going to be at play, I can totally see NASA opting for alternate launch vehicles, especially when there's a very starship-shaped elephant in the room. NASA is best at doing stuff that companies like Blue Origin and SpaceX have no interest in, carrying out research and designing specialist spacecraft like Europa Clipper, the Mars rovers and helicopters, you know, all the cool stuff that we space fans care about that a profit-driven company would never be incentivized to do. And then they could just have those missions launched by the private sector, which already has very capable rockets like Vulcan, Falcon Heavy and New Glenn, with Starship getting closer and closer to operational status with every flight test as well. And there's other rockets like Ariane 6 and the upcoming Rocket Lab Neutron that shouldn't be ignored either. In the current climate, does SLS's one launch every three years at a price tag in the billions per expendable launch vehicle make a lot of sense? It's a bit of a hot topic, so I'd definitely be interested in reading what you think of this in the comments below. Laon Aerospace had a busy one last week. I flew a space shuttle to orbit, built a space station, sent an SSTO to the station, deployed an Apollo-style command vehicle to LKO, and a lot more, all in the name of testing out the incredible new Firefly mod, which overhauls the heating and atmospheric effects in KSP, making them look absolutely incredible, as I'm sure the on-screen footage is demonstrating. Also on screen are the names of my Patreon and YouTube channel supporters. I can only make this content because of the amazing support of you all, so huge, huge thank you if your name is up there, and if it isn't, then consider signing up using the links in the video description. But that is the end of today's episode of Space This Week. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next one.